Welcome to the Recovery Playbook, brought to you by the Menninger Clinic, a national leader in mental health and addictions treatment. We're your hosts, Dr. Daryl Shorter. And I'm Ryan Leaf. Our goal is to elevate conversation about substance use and addictions for anyone who may be impacted. Our episodes will share real issues and the latest treatments and matters of interest to the recovery community. What's today's playbook topic, Ryan? It's very good. It's very good right there. It is recovery today, which ironically, I'm in today. All right. Well, we should probably talk about Let's that. Let's do it. Let's talk about it. So there's lots of money pouring into states right now to address the opioid problem, but it's not fixed. There's still a lot of problems that even though people generally may not see it, mostly because recovery is influenced by stigma. That stigma limits open conversation about recovery. Increasing amount of attention has been paid to the drug problem in our society as a result of the opioid epidemic. Uh, we're seeing an increased number of folks that are experiencing ovi uh, opioid overdose, and the conversation has really shifted as a result of fentanyl, which I know everyone's heard about. Um, but before we can dive in and understand anything about the opioid epidemic, uh, we probably should also talk about recovery. And that's why I'm so excited to discuss recovery today with you. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, opioid use disorder and what opioid use disorder recovery can look like today. Well, it's, uh, it's absolutely the hardest thing I've ever done. I made it to the NFL as one of 27,000 ever, and this is the hardest thing I've ever done. So that's what you are up against. Um, but there is a solution. And for me, it's based around the science of it. I think for the longest time, I thought it was a choice. I thought I was making this conscious choice. I didn't fully understand the effect it had had on my brain. Mm. And so when doctors and scientists were able to show me and tell me why this is happening, uh, it's like anything. When I went to a doctor to get my knee fixed or my shoulder fixed, I trusted them to do the right thing because they had the information. And so that's been the biggest thing for me, understanding that this is a disease. And I'm going to give you a really good example. I'm 11 and a half years sober, and um, I've really knocked out impulsive things in my life. I do things very structured. Uh, about three months ago, my, uh, my father-in-law was visiting. He's elderly. He's handicapped. His doctor has prescribed him some, uh, um, something called Norco. Now, I didn't know what it was, but he said it was a painkiller. And I'm telling you right now, the receptors in your brain, mm. they go off. No matter if you're 11 months or 11 years or 11 days, mm. it doesn't matter. And I immediately went and Googled it. Wow. And then my next step was drug-seeking behavior. I was going to like figure a way to get around the house. And this is at 11 years. Yeah. And my wife knows me really well, and she could tell something was wrong, and she just approached me. And, of course, now I'm more open-minded, and I'll talk about it. And I'll say, I haven't this is she's like, let's just go talk to him. So we went and talked to him, and I've never had that kind of relationship with the with people. I was always so shamed for what I was doing because it was a conscious choice. And he and we came up with an idea, let's get him an RX safe for when he visits. Say what an RX safe is. So it's essentially just a safe that you put your prescription medication in. And um, I have no way of uh, accessing it. Yeah. And it was something as simple as that, and I didn't think about it again. And it proved to me the science around how compromised my brain became because of the addiction. Yeah. And I want everybody out there to understand that when you hear other people say things like, he chose this life, he chose to do this, I have an understanding about that, but I was just witness to exactly how it affected my brain in that way. And that's me living this life every single day still and it's the science of it. So I trust that. Yeah. So one of the things that you said that I think is really critically important for people to understand is that while you can enter recovery, you can be actively engaging in your recovery, doing all of the right things, that sometimes uh, the, the function of the brain is what it is. And it's going to respond to triggers and uh, information with craving preoccupation, that sort of thing. Um, so we want for people to understand that how do you 
how do you reduce that? How do you reduce the possibility of craving? And there are some interesting ways that you might be able to go about doing that from a scientific standpoint. One, of course, is medication. Medications actually uh, can reduce the craving or the desire to use substances of all kinds, but opioids in particular. Uh, I'm going to ask you a kind of a personal question. Have you ever taken a medication for opioid use disorder? Well, when I uh, first um, went into to treatment, uh, I was given an injection of Vivitrol. Okay. And uh, I, 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 can't, I can't recommend it more because it did exactly what I needed it to do. When you get to treatment, the obsession and um, the thought process and the craving is so is so massive. All I was thinking about that and like, how can I get out of here and yeah. and get what I need to to not feel anything? Um, what this injection does is it simply blocks those opiate receptors, allows you to then do the work. Yeah. So I'm going to say a little bit about Vivitrol. Thank you for bringing it up. Um, Vivitrol is the trade name of a medication called naltrexone. Uh, so if anybody goes out and they decide to Google or take a look at naltrexone, you'll see that it comes up under a couple of different kinds of uh, names. One name is Rivia, the other name is Vivitrol. When it's given as an oral medication, it is Rivia. When it's given as an intramuscular injection, it is Vivitrol. Now, naltrexone is interesting for a couple of different reasons. One, it's FDA approved to treat alcohol use disorder. So you might find that people take the oral version of the medication if they are, if they are struggling with an alcohol related. Uh, but oftentimes we end up prescribing Vivitrol, the intramuscular injection of this medication uh, for opioid use disorder because it does some really important things. One, it lasts in your system for 30 days. 30 days. So you don't have to take a daily medication. You take it once a month. That's great. You don't have to worry about whether or not I take it. Do I feel like taking it? It's just in your system, which is great. The other thing is, like Ryan mentioned, it blocks the opioid receptor. So if somebody, say they have a recurrence or a slip, or they may take a medication on top of Vivitrol, they're not going to get high from it. Uh, they're not going to experience the euphoria from the pill or, or, or opioid that they take. So we really like it for that, for that reason as well especially because it can help with overdose prevention. But the final thing, and what the kind of interesting thing that Ryan's pointing out is, or that you're pointing out, is that uh, it can reduce the craving or the desire to use as well, mm -hmm. because it's an anti-craving medication uh, in addition to all of these other great, great uh, aspects of it. Now, let me, bef before they gave you Vivitrol, you probably had to go through something in order Detox. to- Detox. Yeah. Well, you have to be off whatever opiate you're on for seven to 10 days. Seven to 10 days. And that was always the hardest thing for me because I couldn't do it on my own. It's the hardest I wanted thing for to. most people actually. And if I could have, and I could have got to that place where I could get the injection, I, you know, I know, but it just, that's the, the effect it had on my brain. So we should talk about what it takes for somebody to get through that seven to 10 day period where they're not on any opioid at all. Before they, before you were in that seven to ten day phase, did they give you anything before that? Like, oh wow, yeah. you, you did it, you did it. Uh, I did it the, but but it was be, it wasn't because probably they wanted to. It was in a jail cell, so that made uh, well, that, that made it a little harder for make, the medical uh, assisted treatment at the time. Yeah, that'll that'll make it a little difficult. So <laughs> let me back up. To it. So if you aren't necessarily in a jail cell, being forced to do this uh, without medication. Usually we give people medication to help them remain comfortable uh, while they are no longer engaging in either heroin use or fentanyl use or use of other kinds of opioids like Norco, like you mentioned. Uh, and we can do that in a number of different ways. You can get medications like methadone or, or suboxone buprenorphine and get on a taper and go. Is that, um, when you talk about having to be seven to 10 days off though, is methadone and, and, and suboxone, aren't they a form of opiate though? They are. So what you what might happen is, and, and, you know, we don't necessarily recommend that people do this part of it on their own yeah. uh, and at home by themselves. So you say you're in a facility, uh, they give you methadone or suboxone, uh, they stabilize your opioid withdrawal symptoms, uh, they find a dose that works for you, and then they gradually decrease the amount of methadone or suboxone that you're on over a period of days. Uh, and But the plan should be, if you're going to do that, 
that you're going to get on Vivitrol yeah. at the conclusion of that taper. Otherwise, the recommendation is that you remain on the medication. I always had that question, and I've become much yeah. more open-minded around the science of it because um, what one may work for one person may yeah. not be for the other. I don't know the brain chemistry. You're the sure. doctor. You're the you're the professional here. Um, how do you, when you talk to families or when you talk to people who are looking to stop this and you introduce one of those assisted medications um, like Suboxone or Methadone uh, and make them understand what its intent is rather than the idea of it's an opiate treating an opiate. Yeah, that's right. So one of the one of the most commonly held misconceptions, I think, is that, and this isn't just for people in recovery or outside of recovery. I mean, I can encounter this when talking to other physicians, actually. This idea that you are separate, like you are, um, this idea that you are replacing one drug with another. Mm -hmm. uh, people don't necessarily think about the use of methadone or the use of buprenorphine as a medication to treat opioid use disorder, uh, like it's the medication that is treating the illness. Um, we seem to have a, a little bit more mm, understanding and compassion for people that use things like the nicotine patch or nicotine gum in order to replace right. smoking, right? Like we, we, we talk about it as nicotine replacement therapy, but we recognize that these are really important tools for helping people to stop smoking. The same thing is true for medications like methadone and buprenorphine. Um, now, how long someone should remain on methadone or buprenorphine is actually pretty hotly contested uh, in the recovery community. There are some people for whom, now trick, uh, for whom, there, there are some people uh, for whom uh, buf buprenorphine has been life-changing. Yeah. It has like completely revolutionized their entire experience of the world. And they go to an NA meeting and they're told that they're not sober. Yeah. Or you know, I had a patient, well, the first time I ever encountered this, uh, I was still in training and I had a patient who was stable for the first time in his life, uh, in his adult life on buprenorphine. He'd had like 15, 20 years of heroin addiction and it just been extremely compromised as a result of that. And he was on buprenorphine and his sponsor fired him when he found out and he felt like he could no longer go to that meeting. Yeah. So this is a very real issue for people, especially in cases where, where we've got buprenorphine. Um, Before we get out of here, go. I wanted to speak to that point and I think it's what it is. It's, it's the continuation of stigma. Yeah. I don't feel that way around the nicotine patch. But of course, initially when I heard about the, the, the medi med uh, medication assisted, yep. I was like, no. And so you have to, and I think this is what we're hoping with this yeah. podcast, is we're just educating people and hopefully shining a light on something that removes said stigma around where science is headed. And so I'm really grateful that you're here uh, for us to be able to talk about it here on, uh, on our podcast. There it is. Appreciate it. Check us out next time, right here.